I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundational, <laughs> Foundation Educational Webinar Series. I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. And today's webinar is about the heart and vasculitis. And we're grateful to have Dr. Kenneth Warrington with us today to educate us and answer some questions. And before we get started, let me begin by introducing Dr. Warrington. Dr. Kenneth Warrington is a consultant and serves as chair in the Division of Rheumatology Department of Internal Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, with a joint appointment in the Gonda Vascular Research Vascular Center. Dr. Warrington is also a director of the Vasculitis Subspecialty Group. He joined the staff of the Mayo Clinic in 2006 and holds the academic rank of Professor of Medicine, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. Dr. Warrington's research and practice interests are in the field of vasculitis, particularly large vessel vasculitis, and he conducts clinical and translational research and has published extensively on these diseases. Well, welcome, Dr. Warrington. It's so great to see you today. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk about vasculitis. Before we get started, I should share a few disclosures. I have been conducting clinical trials with support from BMS, Eli Lilly, and Kinixa, and I have also received compensation from Amgen and Sanofi for consulting activities. Well, thank you for those disclosures, and I think we have something special to start with today, so I'm going to try and share my screen and see if I can make this work. There we go. We have a quiz for everybody today, so we're going to start with the first question, and that is, on average, your heart beats how many times a day? The possible answers are 1,500, 2,000, 100,000, or 79,000. And I really had to think about this one for a while. The answer is 100,000. I'm a little shocked about that. <laughs> I guess I just didn't think about it in those terms. Anything else we need to know about that, Dr. Warrington? It, it is impressive, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I think it's just a reminder of this, this organ that is so vital, right? And it's all muscle, and that muscle is constantly working to keep the blood pumping throughout the body. So that's why it's a vital organ and it, it is busy. It is busy. Let's move to question number two. What is this part of the body called? Is it a ventricle? Is it the aorta or an atrium? And the answer is, it is the aorta. Honestly, I am not the best at knowing the various pieces of the heart. I think I knew that one, but is that a common misconception or something that people don't know? I, we know what the big muscle is. Do we always know what the other parts of it are? Right, yeah, and this is such an important distinction, right? So so the heart is is the muscle, the organ that's pumping the blood, but then it has to have a conduit, right? A, a hose, a pipe, um, and that's basically where the blood is going to flow through. So the heart pumps it, pumps the blood into the aorta. That's the largest artery in the body. Again, keeping in mind that arteries take the blood from the heart, distribute the blood to the rest of the body, and the aorta is our biggest artery. So when we talk about vasculitis, the aorta is going to become important when we talk about large vessel vasculitis because the aorta is the largest blood vessel, the largest artery that we have in the body. Hmm. I actually didn't know that. That should have been another one of our questions. All right, let's move on to the next question. The arteries that supply blood to the heart muscle are the coronary arteries, the cartoid arteries, or the subclavian arteries. Now, I can tell you I do not know this one for sure. My husband's medical brain would know this answer. And the answer is coronary arteries, which makes sense now that I look at it. Right. So these are the 
arteries, they are kind of more in the medium uh, category, medium-sized arteries. And they are the arteries that are so important because they are carrying blood to the heart muscle. And that is what is necessary to keep the muscle supplied with oxygen, with nutrients, and support the heart muscle. And uh, these arteries can be involved in some people with vasculitis, and, and we'll talk more about that. Okay. And then moving to the next one, which of the following types of vasculitis are more often associated with affecting the aorta? I think I know this one, but we're going to let everybody look at the choices. EGPA, MPA, polyarteritis nodosa, Takyasu arteritis, or GCA? Those are some choices there, and the answer is Takyasu arteritis and GCA, two answers. Absolutely, and this is what I alluded to earlier. So the aorta being the largest artery, then we fall in a category of large vessel vasculitis. And, and the two main ones in that category are Takayasu arteritis and giant cell arteritis. So now we already know that these two types of vasculitis uh, may involve and often do involve the aorta. Okay, that does make sense. And now which types of imaging tests can be used to determine if there is inflammation in the aorta? Would that be x-ray, CAT scan, dog scan, PET scan, or ultrasound? It's interesting that all those choices were put in there. And the answer is PET scan. I'd love for you to elaborate on that a bit. Absolutely. And why we have, you know, some reference to animals here, PET is not referring to our favorite furry friend, but it stands, it's an acronym, it stands for positron emission tomography. So a long word that basically indicates that we're able to use this special type of scan to look for inflammation in the arteries, mainly in the large arteries. So it's really good that picking up inflammation in the aorta and its main branches. Now, sometimes we might use a CAT scan. It would be a special type of CAT scan, a CT angiogram. So CT angiogram, sometimes MRI or MR angiogram can be used to look for inflammation. And then again, PET scan is often used as well to look for inflammation. Okay, moving on to the next question. Which of the following structures of the heart can be affected by vasculitis? Coronary arteries, the valves, the myocardium, or the pericardium? And the answer to that would be all of them. Absolutely. So these are all very important structures inside the heart, right? The coronary arteries we talked about a little bit. They are the arteries supplying the heart muscle. The valves are those structures on the inside that, that help the direction of blood flow. The myocardium is muscle, the muscle of the heart itself. And the pericardium is the sac that's around the heart, that's enveloping the heart. And all these structures can be affected by vasculitis. And we often think about these and, and look for uh, vasculitis affecting these structures uh, in our patients. Okay, and our bonus question, which of the characters in The Wizard of Oz wanted a new heart? The Scarecrow, Toto, the Cowardly Lion, or the Tin Man? Come on, if you don't know this one, it might be because you're not aged properly. <laughs> and the answer is the Tin Man. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Warren, Warrington, for doing uh, putting up with us during our, our questions and answer section. And we are, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so we can see our faces again. And uh, we do have um, some other questions, but before we get started on any other questions, did you have anything that you wanted to add about the heart and vasculitis before I ask you some questions we've gotten from patients? Oh, I just think the quiz was really cool, you know, because it's so important to have a basic understanding of 
which structures are we talking about? And as we started saying, you know, sometimes the aorta, um, perhaps it's not entirely clear, you know, how that has a relationship kind of to the heart. So uh, oftentimes when we're talking about the heart, it really is so closely linked, right? That we're talking about the arteries that are coming right out of the heart, but we do want to understand kind of the differences and and which of those structures we're talking about. So, and I have a just a question just because we were talking about large vessel vasculitis. So I'm somebody with small vessel vasculitis. Does that mean I don't really have to worry about vasculitis and uh, with the heart? Well, so uh, again, I think it's important to kind of clarify. So with small vessel vasculitis, we're looking at much smaller blood vessels, capillaries, very small arteries, arterioles. Now, small vessel vasculitis can affect the heart. Uh, in fact, for example, with GPA, with MPA, with EGPA, we could see inflammation of the heart muscle itself because it has tiny blood vessels embedded in the in the heart muscle. Um, there could be inflammation of the pericardium, so the lining outside the heart. Those are things we can see with small vessel vasculitis. Uh, generally, though, we do not see involvement of the aorta. And again, the aorta being the largest or large form of a uh, large artery. And so generally in small vessel vasculitis, we do not see involvement of the aorta. Now in medicine, not everything is black and white. And so there are rare instances where there can be overlap between small and large vessel vasculitis, but that would be extremely uncommon. Well, thank you for that personal answer. I threw you a curveball there. And one of our first patient questions today is, if a patient is diagnosed with tachyasus or GCA, should he or she immediately be tested for or checked for any heart involvement with the vasculitis? Or is that something that's just monitored by watching for potential symptoms as they develop? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And again, with the heart being such a vital organ, right? Th this is something that we want to be mindful of. So starting with giant cell arteritis, that's a more common form of vasculitis. Giant cell arteritis generally does not affect or involve the heart itself, but it does commonly affect the aorta. Again, that big artery that's coming right out of the heart. And we know that about 50 to 70% of patients with giant cell arteritis do in fact have inflammation of the aorta. And oftentimes we go looking for that with imaging, with scans, once a patient is diagnosed. So either if we are suspecting giant cell arteritis or if we're diagnosing giant cell arteritis, in pretty much every patient, we are going to look for inflammation of that aorta that sits right above the heart. In Takayasu, we have a slightly different um, concern. In Takayasu, again, being a form of large vessel vasculitis, we are concerned about involvement of the aorta, that big artery sitting above the heart. But then in some patients, we might also be concerned about involvement of the coronary arteries. Those are more medium-sized arteries. Those are the arteries that are feeding the heart muscle and are so important in keeping the heart muscle healthy. Coronary artery involvement is seen in up to about a third of patients with Takayasu arteritis. Now, we may not look for this in every patient, but certainly we would be vigilant for any symptoms that might indicate lack of blood supply to the heart muscle, like chest pain or shortness of breath with exertion. Okay, thank you for that. The next question is, when is a PET scan helpful in the evaluation of someone with suspected or diagnosed vasculitis? Are there different PET scans and how often is a PET scan needed? We sort of touched on that. Yeah, so, and uh, let's see here, if I can share my screen. That would be great. I'll need permission to share, please. All right, if we can fix that for you so you can share your screen. And as we mentioned briefly, a- um, That'd be good. Awesome, thank you. A PET scan shown right 
here in this picture. And there are different types of PET scans. And what we are looking for in people with vasculitis, like Takayasu or giant cell arteritis, is a body PET scan. We generally scan from the head down to the mid thigh. In a PET scan, the radiologist or x-ray specialist is injecting a dye. It's usually sugar, glucose with a radioactive tracer. And basically what we're looking on the scan is to see if the wall of the aorta, so here's the aorta, again, the largest artery in the body. We are looking to see whether the dye is being taken up by the wall of the aorta. So basically we're looking, does the wall of the aorta light up on the scan? And as you can see here in this patient with vasculitis, the wall of the aorta lights up. We're seeing that bright color. That tells us there is inflammation in that aorta. A lot of work has been done at the NIH by Dr. Grayson and his colleagues showing that PET scan can be very helpful in picking up uh, inflammation of the uh, of the aorta. But perhaps it can be a little uh, confusing because there are other forms of PET scan and there are PET scans that focus purely on the heart. And those are often ordered by a cardiologist when they're looking to see whether there is enough uh, blood supply to, uh, to the heart. We use PET scan when we are looking to diagnose somebody with large vessel vasculitis. And then we may use PET scan further down in the disease process if we want to figure out, is the disease active or have we brought it into remission with treatment? I was going to ask, based on what you were just talking about, is it common that um, GCA or Takayasu's manifests as a heart problem originally? Are there other things that they get diagnosed first, or, or or can that be the reason for the diagnosis? Yeah, in giant cell arteritis, it can be tricky because inflammation of the aorta does not produce symptoms. So sometimes patients may come in with symptoms of polymyalgia rheumatica. So they have aching stiffness in the neck, shoulders, hips. Maybe they've been on some prednisone. They're not getting better. Their inflammation markers are still elevated. Some patients may just have what we call constitutional symptoms. So they don't feel well. They may have low-grade fever. Um, it can be sort of a puzzling illness. And then we, we uh, or their local provider performs a PET scan, sometimes because they're looking for other things. So mm -hmm. they may be looking for, is this uh, you know a hidden infection or a hidden cancer? And then they see there's inflammation in the aorta. And that kind of uh, triggers, you know, or, or, or allows us to um, obtain the diagnosis. So, so sometimes that's how how things come about. And similarly in Takayasu, um, if uh, the diagnosis is perhaps um, still being established, a PET scan can help show us that inflammation. Okay, thanks. And and also there was a um, another question about PET scans from the from a patient when a Pet when PET imaging is done on the heart, is it difficult to distinguish whether an artery is being affected by cholesterol or from vasculitis? And how is this determination made from looking at the imaging results? Great question. Yeah. You know, cholesterol, of course, can deposit in the arteries and is the most common cause of heart disease, right, worldwide. And it results when it blocks those coronary arteries, those arteries feeding the heart, then folks can get a heart attack. Um, and so cholesterol deposits are the most common reason for arteries to become narrow or blocked. In vasculitis, we're looking for inflammation, right? So it's a little bit of a different uh, process. It's because our immune system, white blood cells, et cetera, are entering the wall of the artery and causing swelling and inflammation. And that's where the PET scan comes in. So for example, if we're not sure whether cholesterol is the problem um, that's affecting the arteries or is it inflammation, the PET scan can help us to differentiate those two because in people with cholesterol deposits, the PET scan would not light up, would not show inflammation. Whereas in somebody with vasculitis, the PET scan lights up 
and tells us the reason for the blood vessel problem. Again, in medicine, not everything is, is black and white. Sometimes there are gray areas, but it is a helpful test. Keeping in mind, again, I know this terminology can get confusing, but I am mainly referring to a body PET scan where we are using the PET scan to look at the aorta. The cardiologists can use a different form of PET scan just to look at the heart muscle and the blood supply to the heart itself. Oh, interesting. Okay. And uh, another, a question from another patient. I was diagnosed with Takayasu's last year. There was some mild inflammation of the aorta. I used to be physically active, but I'm worried and confused if this inflammation means I need to cut back on exercise or exertion. When heart inflammation is involved, what are patients advised to do or not do with lifestyle, exercise, and eating? Yeah, that's a really important question and one that comes up quite frequently. And again, in the first part of the question, the uh, this individual is referring to the aorta. So when there is inflammation of the aorta, that really should not detract from any physical activity. Of course, we want to treat inflammation and we do that with medications, but it should not limit the person's um, ability or really restrict that person from any activities that, that they want to uh, pursue or enjoy doing. It's a little different if the aorta, again, that big artery above the heart, develops an aneurysm. So if there is an aneurysm, sometimes we do restrict patients from things like sudden heavy lifting. But again, that's somebody who has an aneurysm. Um, you know, that's that can be a consequence of inflammation, but generally is a late complication. But inflammation alone would not, in the aorta, would not result in us limiting activity. When it comes to the heart itself, that may be a little different. So if there is inflammation in the heart and the heart muscle itself, then that is going to fall under the realm of a cardiologist and the cardiologist would need to really help uh, the, the individual understand what is the best form of physical activity for them. Well, and so your answer, as always, it so much depends on the situation and you need to rely on your doctors for your specific answers. But thank you for covering Absolutely. that for us. We had one more question that came in today and we haven't thrown this one at you before. So I'm hoping you can help us with it. But um, the question was, what is cardiac fibrosis and does it have some regard with having to do with vasculitis? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So fibrosis refers to scarring, and it can affect really any part of the body. Um, it is one of the body's ways to uh, to heal, to recover. So for instance, a simple um, analogy is if you cut yourself, cut your skin, the body heals by forming scar tissue. And that's a process that in medical terms we call fibrosis. Now, this, ind this uh, individual is asking about fibrosis of the heart, cardiac fibrosis. And again, cardiac fibrosis is scar tissue in the heart. It can be a consequence of damage from vasculitis. Fibrosis can also happen for other reasons. For instance, if a person has a heart attack and they have cardiac damage from a heart attack, that can lead to fibrosis. But vasculitis can also lead to fibrosis. Again, it refers to scarring or scar tissue. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, thank you. Honestly, I think that's all of our questions about the heart and vasculitis today, Dr. Warrington. And I, I appreciate your um, giving us the answers that we so often get through emails and social media groups and things. And we're very happy that you spent your time with us and answered those for us today. Um, is there any last minute things you want to add before I thank our the appropriate organizations? Well, it, it's my pleasure to uh, discuss with you and to talk about these topics. Again, I would encourage all patients to learn about the um, their vasculitis, of course, but also, you know, which body parts are being affected. And that I think can help patients ask educated questions uh, to their providers and be knowledgeable about their disease. 
Yes, thank you for reminding of uh, us of that. And, and thank you so much for spending your time with us today, Dr. Warrington. And I'd also would be remiss if I didn't thank the Vasculitis Foundation for providing this educational webinar series and our sponsors, AstraZeneca and Novartis for helping us out this year with our uh, webinar series. Thank you so much. Thank you.